Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor. There is so much going on right now, and I have seen some of the most bullish stuff I've ever seen today. And I'm about to show you something else. But I, I want everybody to understand, make no mistake, this SEC versus Ripple thing, this has a lot more to do with the this country and how it's going to be going forward than it, than it even does about crypto, folks. This the way the SEC has behaved in this thing and the way that they've made it clear that, that they operate as an agency is downright frightening for the future of this country. Especially when you see how other agencies behave that are much more in line with what we want for this country and, and we want for, in order for businesses to thrive in this country. It's like you've got this some it's almost like a communist regime versus um, pro-business organizations that want to help businesses thrive. This Gary Gensler represents, he, he's almost, it's almost like the Chinese regime coming after our businesses. I mean, it's crazy what's going on. And you'll see it in, the, in pictures in this video. Now, I wanted to show you this from Coin Paprika before we get going, coinpaprika.com. Um, Look at this. These are the return rates over the last seven days, 30 days, and quarter. This surprised even me. XRP is the only digital asset that is up for the last seven days, up for the last 30 days, and up for the last quarter. Now, the ones that are up for the last quarter the most, one of them's Ethereum because of the merge, but it has been diving like a falling rock now. And then you had Quant do really well over the quarter. But look at XRP. That makes you wonder, doesn't it? 15% in, in the quarter, on the quarter. Now, on the, against the backdrop of all the news that I'm going to show you and all the things going on, because I think that this is mega bullish for Ripple and mega bullish for XRP, what we're seeing. I want to remind you that Ripple, as of this morning when I look, they've got Ripple equity. I've said it a thousand times. There's going to be a day you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, Oh, I had a chance at getting Ripple equity and now I can't get it because they're going to be heading to IPO. And it, I'll put a link to this in the very top of the description. Click on the link and tell them DAI sent you. Now, check this out because I've, I've heard a term that I've never heard before in all of the TA that I've, that I've covered uh, where these guys are doing TA in crypto. And I thought it was great. The XRP, XRP attaching to the box of steel. So now we have box of steel. It's not a falling wedge, not of this, not of that. A box of steel. The XRP box of steel is right here. I have no earthly idea what they're talking about, but it's a box of steel. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. All right. Check this out. Look at that real close, folks. That is, is um, Caroline D. Pham of the CFTC. Okay. The next stop on my learning tour was visiting Ripple Labs. Thanks, Brad Garlinghouse. Brad Garlinghouse. Okay, so she visits Ripple headquarters. And I said, meanwhile, Gary Gensler tries to lure American businesses in to come and see him so he can sue them. Pay attention, Congress. Pay attention, Americans. And then, um, and then I said, Jamie Dimon and Gary Gensler probably have a, a picture just like this. Folks. Think about this. Have you ever heard Gary Gensler even whisper the idea of him going to businesses and trying to actually work with these businesses and talk to them about how they may be able to thrive and industry can grow in this country and then they in turn hire a bunch of people to work for them, things that would make this country great? No, you haven't seen him do anything like that. All he does is threatens them and says, well, you need to come in and see us. Otherwise, we're coming after you. That's always putting the entire country under this veil, this dark cloud of fear. Putting crypto under this dark cloud of fear. That's what Gary Gensler represents. This is literally like 
like a Star Wars movie. Dark forces versus the rebel forces that are trying to create a situation where the country can thrive. It's sick. These people are sick, man. I mean, that is sick what we're seeing. Gary Gensler represents everything that I don't want my children to grow up in. Everything. This woman, I called it, I called it a few months back. This is June 1. I said, we have an emerging crypto hero in crypto. Ethereum free pass equals Web3. Watch this clip from Caroline D. Fam right here. What I think the UST uh, meltdown really highlights is we need to make sure that we're not allowing shadow banking 3.0. And that we really are coming up with a policy and regulatory solution for that. So I think that the bill has a lot of really promising elements. Shadow banking 3.0 is Ethgate, folks. That's what we've uncovered, and she knows it. But I haven't seen it yet, but from what I've heard, I think it's really encouraging that there is such a comprehensive uh, effort to create a more holistic and clear regulatory framework around digital assets in the United States. I think that really makes sure that you know the U.S. is at the forefront of innovation and that we're really promoting American competitiveness on the global stage. That is so important. I'm the sponsor of the CFPC's Global Markets Advisory Committee, and that's going to be one of the key things that I'm going to be looking at in helping to inform what international standards should be in place so that there's a level playing field for the U.S. versus the rest of the world, who has moved faster than we have on the regulation of crypto assets or on digital assets. That is what this country needs, not a government hack like Gary to come in and scare the entire industry so that everybody's losing money left and right. This is what we need. People like this. Yes, people need to know what the rules are so they can follow them. I don't believe in any kind of gotcha regulation where the rules are constantly changing on people and they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. I believe that responsible actors do want to comply with the laws. That's how they can grow their business in a compliant way. But it's incumbent upon regulators to make sure that we're providing that regulatory clarity. And we have a lot of tools to do that that don't involve bringing enforcement cases where, you know, the, the broad implications of this could result in, uh, first of all, uh, looking at the securities laws and uh, applying the Howey test to particular types of tokens. Um, that's mm -hmm. something. And then there's, of course, uh, what others have commented on, which is a chilling effect that it's having on the industry because of the fact that it's uh, yeah, you disruptive got, to file a you got complaint Darth like this Vader but not have that's a, running the a runway show. way or a path to the regulation and compliance. She needs to kick Gary's butt what she needs to do now. Um, so then there was this. Elon Musk's Starlink is now active on all continents, including Antarctica. Um, and it reminded me of the one person I've seen that has gone to Antarctica in the last year. And that is Joel Katz, David Schwartz. Okay. And here he is. This guy had tweeted, David Schwartz is probably setting up an XRP ledger node in Antarctica. And that's him getting off the ship. <laughs> I just thought that was interesting. Then there was this. This morning, CNBC Squawk Box decided that it would be great to have Jay Clayton in the studio. He's such a great guy. They should have him in the studio. And so I reminded Becky Quick. I said, hey, Becky Quick, the suit against the SEC on behalf of XRP holders, now over 72,000. And I saw that you had Jay on again this morning. You said you tried to look into it. You either lied to your audience or you or you didn't try very hard. Which is it? And this is what I'm referencing. Jay, let me ask you about something that it winds up in my Twitter feed constantly. I've, I've tried to look into it. winds up in your Twitter feed because it's truth and you don't pay any attention to the truth. And done a little research on it. There's this argument about um, an action that the SEC brought on your last day as the chair of the SEC. This was the one to go after Ripple Labs executives, the CEO, the general counsel and others, and kind of come after them for some sales that they had planned and whether they were up front. Then of course he can't comment on it, which is a lie too. But the point is, is that she said that she was gonna, trying to look into it, but she didn't look into anything. She's never brought it up again. Now. It's a big club and we just ain't in it. This is 97 members of Congress reported trades in companies influenced by their committees. There's Cynthia Loomis right there in the middle of the picture. And today, um, XRP Darren found this clip of Cynthia Loomis. I took parts of the clip and then put some truth around it because Cynthia Loomis and, and Senator Gillibrand 
their bill starts with the false premise that Bill Hint from Bill Hinman's speech that somehow Bitcoin and Ethereum, which is the, the lie that we've been talking about for over a year now, they, their bill starts with the false premise that somehow Bitcoin and Ethereum are decentralized and all the rest of crypto is not. It's a lie. They know it's a lie. And so as long as they know it's a lie and, and, and they're on video wanting to talk about it, then we are going to put a big spotlight on the lie. So here you go. Is would something like Cardano be considered a security? Well, it is most likely that uh, of all of the cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum would be commodities. But there are a lot of crypto assets that are not sufficiently diversified um, in terms of their ownership. You own 10% of total ETH supply at Genesis. My question to you, given that we're gonna be moving on now to, to proof of stake and where supply de de decentralization of Ethereum is so important, can you tell us how much ETH you and consensus still control on Ethereum? Uh, uh, no, I, I wouldn't uh, disclose that personally. Or the manner in which uh, they are overseen. Uh, the fact that Bitcoin certainly and Ether uh, as well to an extent are, are tremendously uh, ubiquitous. Because I want to just real double down a little bit more on supply distribution and it's for you, Joe. Are you concerned at all that early investors in ETH during the ICO still hold and control a lot of the supply of zero, Ethereum? Zero, given zero that concern you, about that. Given zero. that you've explained... From what I know, I have zero concern that there's uh, 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 any sort of concentration amongst original owners. I, I do think that there's Even a chance. Even though it's possible, people I do think there's a out. chance that there's a concentration amongst people who accumulated after. Uh, in terms of the way in which they are owned and uh, the manner in which their algorithms are approved of. Uh, makes them the most likely candidates. And I know. I'm I'm also lots of people are focused on doing that. Early ICO investors to to use different tactics to buy into the ICO using multiple accounts, using multiple different identities. That's not a concern for you moving into the merge about investors that potentially could have zero concern. He's got zero concern, but he's not going to expound on it at all. Then James Thaland put this out. The SEC says it takes no position on the Chamber of Digital Commerce filing amicus brief, but asks to respond and may request more time or pages if, if additional amicus briefs are allowed. That last line is clearly a threat directed at John Deaton. This person says, oh, I see. So that we turn against John for delaying the case. I say, F that. Hey, John, file all the briefs you want. You got my blessing, and John <laughs> says, here's Johnny. Um, then as we go on, John says, I can't file anything until I read the exhibits attached to the briefs, which, which are currently sealed. This is the SEC sadistically trying to cause panic among XRP holders who will read this and think a significant de delay. I have plenty of time, and our brief won't cause delay. I've never seen an agency with such a disdain and contempt, with such disdain and contempt for the people they're supposed to protect. It's utterly disgusting and they should be ashamed of themselves, but unfortunately they're not. And then Stefan Huber says, we at the SEC don't even disagree with Digital Chamber, but if John Deaton comes along too, then we will do everything we can to drag this out further again. And then here's John, another clip that Digital Perspectives put out of John talking to Eleanor Terrett. A lot of people remember there were like 30,000 requests for admissions. And in those requests for admission, they destroyed the SEC because they, they made the SEC admit that there is no duty by Ripple to an XRP holder. There's no duty. And that an XRP holder by owning XRP has no legal interest in Ripple, the company. And so then they shifted gears and then their, their, their expert witnesses started testifying that the common enterprise is the XRP ecosystem. Well, what the hell is the XRP ecosystem means? That means everybody.
That means Ripple. That means you as XRP holder, me as XRP holder, means Jay from Spin the Bits as XRP holder, <laughs> means anybody. It means everybody together. But here on page, what I want to tell people is that there's always something that they write that just kills me. And on page uh, uh, 17, they write that the escrow account's purpose was to remind investors of the common enterprise XRP represented. So I guess XRP is the common enterprise now, according to the SEC. Or they're saying XRP represents the common enterprise. Just like when I filed that motion to intervene, and on page 24 of their opposition, they say that XRP is a representation of the investment contract. The SEC is making this shit up as they go. And that is a fact that is not an opinion. Wow. Then guess who shows up today is Bob Way. Bob Way was somebody who can't, showed up in the XRP community about two years ago, I think now. And he was, he was doing interviews. He was going to meetups. He was doing all this stuff. And this guy was one of the first 10 employees at Ripple. And then all of a sudden he disappeared. And I don't know what the reasons were, but he just disappeared. And today for the first time, actually I can go show you, uh, for the first, last time he tweeted was on August 27th of 2019. He shows up today and he's just asking some question having nothing to do with crypto. Um, and then, but what's interesting is, um, he liked something too. Um, first, this guy says, we got your back. Are you going to do something? Um, he's, and then he says, this person had said, is a, is a, it's a hint. Our wait time for XRP will be longer. And he liked it. And hopefully he was joking there. <laughs> but the most sig significant thing I ever remember from Bob Way was this right here. And I had tweeted this out a while back saying, where's Bob Way? He, he said, this is a quote from his, I guess his LinkedIn page a while back. Several people left fancy jobs and joined Ripple because I paraphrase, if we capture, capture even a minor fraction of the international payments market, do you know the value XRP will need to, to have, need to have to support that? Do the math, really, really big trade number divided by 100 billion XRP, wow. Those sort of conversations always buoyed my spirits and made me smile, but really they also gave me anxiety and made me remember that my job was to make sure we don't all F this up. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button and tell your friends and family that Bob Way might be back.